Todd, thank you so much for coming to the show today and actually coming in my studio. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. You got a pretty nice setup here. Uh, it's all professional. Uh, I hope your uh, setup can give me a little more hair on the side too as well. I'm not sure if that's uh, included in the gig or not. But, uh, I can get you a hat. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's oh, how I deal with it. Oh, by the way, congratulations on your new fantastic book. Got to get the preview of it before you got it out there to the world. And uh, congratulations and uh, proud of you doing such an awesome thing out there and uh, sharing your story to the world, man. Hey, keep on doing it. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's hard to be humble. You know what I mean? Where people are like, Hey, great job doing it. And you're like, ah, I'm just doing what I want to do is educating people. Nice. And that's why I do this show because I want business owners and other people who, you know, understand that you're going to make failures. You're going to make mistakes. They could sometimes destroy your company or almost destroy your company and you learn from them and that's okay. You just need to learn from and move forward because things are going to happen. Everybody asks me, why do I promote myself and not my company? And I always say, because my company could be gone tomorrow because we don't, you know, you never know what's going on with the current administration, how it's going to affect our industry. You never know what's going to happen. So you really always need to promote yourself and your company second. Totally agree. Totally agree, man. Yeah. All right. So we're here to find out how you fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, to put it bluntly all right so yeah. I, I i've been doing inner edison for a couple of years i took about three months off because i didn't like the direction it was going my original direction was your greatest accomplishments come from your greatest defeats and i wanted to find out those edison moments and how you overcame them i kind of go way off the tracks and just started doing podcasts with everybody occasionally there'll be those moments and some people come in and help you not have those moments you're going to have those moments no matter what. And I want to focus on those moments now. And that's why I have you here today. I want to know what was your biggest failure and what happened? Ah, so uh, are you okay with talking yeah, about it today? Yeah, you're making me vulnerable at the beginning. I mean, uh, usually I ask for a date and uh, a drink well, or something first, but uh, okay. Or, I guess <laughs> what, <laughs> or what we should really say is, all right, Todd, so you are a huge manufacturer home dealership right or what do you call yourself yeah we're uh we're the large well everybody thinks that uh, i just woke up out of bed and and as a company we became the largest modular home company in california and that just did not happen and i think that's good that you're trying to focus on some of the the negative i think we we get too caught up in all of the hoopla and everybody thinks that everybody just made it and got out of bed and and and, and made it it's not that is not how it how it worked out and there was a huge amount of screw ups uh, and uh, obviously some of them I'm proud of and some I'm not. And, uh, and you already told me that I'm going to have to do one that's uh, that I'm not proud of. So right. uh, let's, let's go at it. All right. I, I mean, I don't, because it, people, and I, and I've had some other people on and you ask them and they, Oh, my biggest thing was I lost $5. You know I mean? Come on. I want to know it's, it's what we learn from other people is you got to ask almost three times why to our clients and everything else. And it's the same thing here. Mm -hmm. I want to know what happened, which you don't want to talk about mm -hmm. because it hurts. Mm -hmm. But until you, it's like anything, until you deal with it or, or let it out, it, then it'll be okay. Yeah. yeah. Let's, uh, let's, let's help some entrepreneurs out and, uh, and learn from our mistakes so they don't make the same ones. Right. So I, I or, I'm all for it. Or they're going to make some mm -hmm. and understand it's okay not to just throw in the towel and run away. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, um, let's let's go at it then. I think the first, uh, I think one of the main things uh, early in my career, um, we were chugging along, we we're killing it, we we're selling a bunch of homes, um, you know, on top of the world. Felt like uh, we were uh, we were un unbeatable, unstoppable. Uh, we built a lot of great relationships, selling a lot of homes all over the all over California, and all of a sudden, uh, the market all of a sudden started to change. And there was uh, actually a larger demand. So we were thinking to ourselves, oh, my gosh, this is great for us. Huge demand. We're going to be able to sell more homes than anybody else. Let's do it. And, uh, and it just didn't happen that way. Uh, what ended up happening at that time when we were growing as a company, we weren't the largest at that time. We were actually one of the smaller dealers uh, that sold brand new manufactured homes. But we had a fantastic relationship with two manufacturers. And uh, I had been told by others that maybe I should, you know, build other relationships and have other manufacturers that uh, carry the product with us and, and be able to sell a diverse amount of homes. But I'm a very loyal guy. So I went, you know what, I built relationships with uh, two really, really strong manufacturers. Uh, they're going to take care of me. No problem. You know, they took me out, wine, dine me. And anytime I needed anything, they helped me out. 
and and I thought we were on top of the world. We we're going to be able to, you know, conquer the world together. Well, when the the market changed and all of a sudden there was a huge demand, the larger manufacturers actually were able to monopolize a lot of the product. And we weren't able to get any product. We got minor amounts of product. So even though we could have sold maybe 20x the amount of homes, because we didn't have the large amount of relationships, they basically told us, well, this is all we can do for you. Sorry, Charlie. Uh, we like you, but you know what? We got to feed the big dogs. And I was like, oh my gosh, you're kidding me, right? I've been so loyal to you. I've taken care of you. This is some obviously some laundry I don't want to air, but you know what? For you, for you, Ed, I'm gonna share all the good and nitty gritty. I want to, I want to help those out there that that know, you know, it's not always uh, the best thing to put all your eggs in one basket. And I'm living proof that you you shouldn't. You need some diversity. You you have to have some other avenues to go in case it goes sideways so uh, i think that's one of my biggest stories that, that, that with you. <laughs> that's really your biggest story that during 2006 when the down you know what happened so you're talking to what year was this oh wow uh I was want to this say 2000 four two, yeah around 2003 2004 so when it, when everything went crazy you couldn't get the manufactured homes yeah which is a big problem because we couldn't we were paying space rent on lots that we needed to fill and we couldn't get a home for a year a year and a half customer says, Hey, I want to buy a home from you. And you can't pro provide the product to them. You have agents and staff members who are trying to feed their family and you can't get them a home. You're not making any money and they're not making any money and they're trying to look for another job. So it's, it is a problem. Even though the market's good, you can't get the product. You can't just like right now, I think people couldn't get cars for a while, right? right. You, you can sell a bunch of cars, but you don't have them. You can't sell them now. Yeah. But how's it? All right. So during the so that was during that period of time i'm going to jump ahead and then i want to go back again mm -hmm, sure. during the pandemic did you have the same issue with the manufacturer shut down um a little bit but because now we're in a different position right we're the we're the largest um we're in the opposite position where we could get a lot of the product we had a little bit of struggle but not as much as obviously uh, the opposite where the smaller dealers they had a problem getting product and we were able to get quite a quite a bit of it all right so let's go back how did you become one of the largest then because it must have been okay or really uh, this could hurt us forever if we don't have anything to sell mm -hmm. and how did you go from that to where you are now uh well from learning from that uh, that lesson uh we built additional relationships uh we built strong relationships even though our core relationship initially uh, wanted us to do all of our business with them uh, we said, you know what, we learned from 2004 and you know what, we need to diversify. We need to have other products out there. So as much as I love to put all my eggs in the basket, you, as I had relationships with the CEO, the second in command, third in command, and that didn't do anything for me. So just the full disclosure, I want to give you as much business as I can, but I can't sacrifice my team's uh, possible success and the ability to be able to sell homes. Right. So, 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 I mean, that's for us, I'm a broker. So I go through multiple wholesale lenders. Mm -hmm. I have one that I give almost all my business to, but I do have all the other ones in place just in case. Right. Cause you never know what's going to happen with somebody. Um, and that's like, you, you just never know what's going to happen. You have to have big relationships, a lot of relationships, and you also need to nurture those, but that couldn't be your biggest mistake because yeah. that wasn't your mistake. That was just the market. <laughs> Um, I, I think it is a mistake. I mean, I, well, we, we had that relationship that, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't sell, I couldn't be able to sell any homes. I mean, I, I understand. I understand that, mm -hmm. but okay. So you didn't have relationships and, and I'm not, I'm not saying it's not, but I know there's gotta be something else there too that over, cause I know for me personally going through the stuff, mm -hmm. there's times where I was more leveraged than I should have been. Right. They say three things will take down mm -hmm. a businessman, ladies, liquor, and leverage. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's been times where I've been too leveraged because I put a ton of stuff in doing all this different marketing or all this other stuff and it didn't fit. It didn't, you know, come to fruition or it did. You never know, but it's all, we gamble all the time with our business to a certain point, trying to grow, trying to do that. So, and I, I'm not trying to tell you to oh, tell me something else, okay. but, but <laughs> we can get there. I know it's coming to your head, but how did you, so you just built more relationships. You didn't do anything different than that. Um, I mean, obviously I had to build additional relationships. I had to, to make sure that in case that happened again, that my guys would be fed and they'd be able to, to make money and, uh, and wouldn't want to leave. Uh, so, uh, I mean, on, on the people side, there's always the, the hires that you have that you make mistakes on. I mean, I've, I've, I've my, my share, my share of mistakes on keeping people a little bit too long. I, I think that we've had, we've had some folks that, you know, you just think that they're going to turn the corner 
and they they become bigger headaches than uh, than than they're worth. Let's just put it that way. And as much as you hope and and wish that they would do well, um, uh, leopards don't change their stripes, unfortunately. So no, I think that's people don't change. Yeah, I, I wish I, I wish they did. Or if not, I think we'd all be in a lot better position. But we've had some pretty, pretty bad hires out there that that I wish we had cut the cord maybe a year earlier, two years earlier. But uh, sometimes it's it's a matter of uh, trying to figure out, is there an opportunity for them to uh, to go somewhere else and make money? And sometimes we don't think that there is that opportunity. So we try to think we're the ones that are going to save the world and we're going to we're going to change that person. And uh and I don't know about you, Ed, but I, I, I feel like, you know, uh, I try to save the world. I try to save everybody. And sometimes you end up just, you know, shooting yourself in the foot instead. So. Yeah, you have to learn you can't save everybody. And you can't, and, there, and people will not change. They are who they are when they come to you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, there might be the one one percent that changes, but most of the time people just don't change. They are who they are when they come and they're not going to change or they'll go back to it. Yeah. And I could be wrong, but I'm just telling you, I'm different than I was years ago in my twenties and thirties and forties and fifties, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I'm in. <laughs> you look back and the things that bothered you in your twenties don't bother you in your thirties and don't what bothers you in your thirties don't bother you in your forties and vice versa. But all right, looking back, so I know the hires and other stuff, but looking back, would you have done anything differently? And, and I don't want to get at, well, I want more relations. We understand that. Is there mm -hmm. anything else that you would think that you'd wanted, should have done differently? If somebody was going to start a large, which is, you've been doing this for what, two years now? <laughs> yeah, 20, 26. 26 yeah. Years, yeah. So it took you a while to get to the size of a company you have. Have you guys thought about, and I, this is just a question I had before we move on, by starting and actually building them yourself, um, becoming a manufacturer and then a, of your own? Yeah, we uh, we've obviously thought about that. Uh, I don't think that financially that would be something that uh, we would take the risk on. Uh, it's just it's just too big of a project, and we like to stay in our lane. We like to build them and and try to figure out how to design them. But on on the manufacturer side, I think there's a labor side that we were we we're not that's not our expertise at this point. I think maybe today we are. Uh, but back uh, as we were growing, I don't think I think that'd be the logical uh, reason and to, to try to get into that. But financially, we just weren't there. I mean, I started from ground up. So we were my wife and I, we partnered up and we we ended up, you know, trying to go from, you know, cleaning toilets and selling balloons on the street to. to you All know, right, let's to go back to that. Is that what you guys is that how you started in business? Yeah, I mean, that's. Uh, Tell us your story now. I mean, uh, I mean, we for myself, uh I ended up, you know, working at a gas station and and cleaning toilets and uh, and ended up pumping gas. And back when there's a self self service station, yeah, that was, uh, there was, that was in the eighties, man. Yeah, full, full, full service is still <laughs> in the still in the nineties, man. Early nineties uh, off of Capitol Center East Side. Um, I, I don't want to throw the gang signs up, but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we uh, we we still did that. We pump put tires. Uh, got was air in the tires. We cleaned the windshields and did all that cool stuff. So. Uh, so that taught me the value of a dollar, man. Me and my buddy, uh, turned out me and my buddy that worked at the Pizza Hut right across, we ended up being uh, some of the more successful guys out there because on the weekends we weren't hanging out and and uh, doing whatever. We were sitting and, uh, and and working our ass on the Saturdays and Sundays rather than going out party with the friends. Yeah. So that's how we did it. I think the worst thing we, we did for our kids is not have them work. Oh, totally, totally, yeah. totally agree. They... They did not. Uh, I mean, I had to rake the leaves and uh, and uh, wash the cars and do all that for a buck and uh, clean the bathrooms in the house and uh, and and be be happy about it and be lucky that I could stay in the house rather than uh, these days. It's whether or not they got the newest uh, iPad, right? Or, right, or the game game control, yeah. you know, controller or whatever. Um, yeah, it's just because I look back at some of the things we've done and and the way kids are now, and and I'm not and a lot you know i'm generalizing but some are different than this age group but there's certain age group that it's they feel entitled mm -hmm. and that's our fault for giving them everything yeah i i think there was a a, a pinnacle during my uh, during my career that kind of changed things a little bit and that might be a little bit interesting um i think i had promised one of the owners of a park that uh, there was a there was a lot that needed to be cleaned and i was in my nice suit and all that stuff and I, and turned out that the uh, landscapers that I called, they ended up not showing up. So um, that manager did not like me. That manager had a had a thing against me. So uh, they were getting ready to throw me to the wolves and tell the owner how horrible I was. And I decided to go out there and just uh, go pick the weeds myself. 
So her being thinking that's funny, she's taking pictures of, you know, uh, you know, the a real estate broker on their hands and knees pulling weeds. She took those pictures and we went to an association meeting and she showed it to the other peers, the other park managers and ended up saying, hey, can you believe that? I got Todd, the owner of, uh, you know, Advantage to, to be picking weeds at my spot. And it actually worked in reverse. It was really interesting. It was it was she kind of almost you could actually almost see it because they, they were like, oh, well, he was willing to do it. Oh my gosh, you know, I wish I had someone that's willing to keep their word and go on their hands and knees and pick weeds and keep their promise rather than just wanting to make money and give get referrals from me. So at that moment, all of a sudden she realized, oh my gosh, I actually have someone that actually will do stuff for me rather than just take. And the other managers, that was actually almost like a calling card for me. They're like, remember that time that that manager said that? And then all of a sudden, you know, actually a lot of my business blew up because of that and it did really well, well because they, they felt that they could trust me. Right. And you would go do what you said. And if you, they didn't show up, you would take care of it yourself. And I think a lot of people don't realize if you say you're, if you hire somebody to do a job and they don't do that job, that's your responsibility. Mm -hmm. Right. That's and, good. and people don't always think that way, but that's how it is. I remember my kid is, you know, if you hire somebody to do something instead of you doing it and they don't do it, you're responsible for because they used to get their their sister or their brother. They pay them. You go ahead and do this for me. And when they didn't do the job, I'm telling it's your responsibility. But I paid them. Doesn't matter. You didn't take care of the job. It was on you. Yep. It's 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 uh, your your word on the line, and it's uh, it's something simple. And what people a lot of people say, oh well, you know, uh, your word. No, that's that's all you got. Especially in sales. Especially in business. Uh, if if you can't be counted on. Um, you're, you're not worth two cents. I mean, I remember multiple times I met with banks and I ended up doing a lot of repo business. And the first time I had a relationship with, uh, with, uh, one of the banks, I promised him to go out there and I was sick like a dog. And I was like, when my wife was like, well, where are you going? You're, 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 you're terrible. I said, this is the first time I'm meeting this guy and already I'm going to cancel. I, I can't cancel. So, I mean, literally I, I was taking 10 different pills. I was there and I almost passed out. Literally. I, I met up with them. I was I was about to fall on the floor and the guy's like, why didn't you stay home? And I'm like, Hey, I, I gave you my word. I was going to be here. I'm going to, I'm going to be here to take a look at this. And if, if, if you can't trust me the first time you meet me and what, am, who am I going to, you know, what kind of word do I have? And he remembered that in this, to this day, 20 years later, we're still good friends. And he remembers saying, Hey, you know what? I remember you almost passing out and you still wanted to be there. I knew I could always count on you. So, so that's why I worked with you, Todd. So, so, under promise over deliver. No, definitely. Right. I mean, that's basically you, you, word. Your word is your bond, period. Whatever you say, you must do. You know, handshakes are the way it's supposed to be. Shouldn't need contracts. But I mean, in this day and age, you have to have a contract. Um, otherwise, you know, some people just won't do what they're supposed to do. Yeah, but I think it's more about the little things too. It's not just, hey, you know what? Did I did I deliver my contract? Did I did I do what I say what I'm gonna do? It's it's the little things that you promise too that lead up to the larger responsibilities, you know, the larger project. You don't know what's laying behind the weeds there that that could be. I remember one one guy was almost testing me. He was like, Oh, you know what? Hey, could you tell me, you know, what uh, what these two manufacturers can do for me? And and could you get back to me in, in two days? And and it ended up, I was like, Oh, you know what, this does it doesn't sound like it's gonna you know, he's just kicking the tires, but I did it anyways. And he said, you know what? I called 10 other people and I said exactly the same thing. And, you know, you were the only one who gave it to me on time, Todd. I was like, you're kidding me, right? Yeah. He said, yep. And I, I purposely told you that it wasn't a big deal. I'm not in a rush and, you know, yeah, you can do it whenever. And, you know, I'm not really serious. Uh, I'm not really sure if I'm going to do it or not. I wanted to see if you'd still come through, even though I didn't sound like a great prospect. Well, and you did. No, it's just, you know, I'm, I'm trying to go back with what we looked at and how, um, you know, you did things differently because of, you know, being a, not being able to get product and now you're larger and now you can get any product you want to a certain point. Now you do manufactured homes and modulars. Yeah. Manufactured homes, modulars, uh, mobile homes uh, are a specialty. Mm hmm. Well, mobile homes are manufactured homes, aren't they? Yeah, they're they're all at just uh, different levels, right? <laughs> well, okay. Now I'm going to give you my little spiel that I tell every agent. Um, um, so in in June of '76, HUD came out with guidelines and said from here forward, because they this crap that was done before, we don't even, we're going to call that mobile homes, and the stuff going forward, we're going to call manufactured homes, and the number one thing has to be on a chassis built on a chassis that can be brought out on site. 
that's the difference and people get confused but most manufacturers the same as the mobile homes and that's what people just need to know exactly right Thank you. modular is the stuff that's built in a factory just like a stick built out on site the difference is they have three shifts and people show up they have supervisors <laughs> they have people who make sure that there's quality control a little different than on a, on site sometimes yeah i don't know if you uh saw that post i did recently on a two-story um, I've gotten a lot of uh, pings on people saying, wow, I didn't know manufactured homes. You could do two story. I didn't know they could either. Yeah. And then they did uh fourplex. So we've done fourplexes and, uh, and they're manufactured, not modular manufactured homes or modular. Um, well, the, 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 I want, so okay, you, okay, you're okay, talking sorry, to sorry, the lender sorry, sorry, side. Okay, got it. Got it. Yeah. Um, so the, the and I don't want to get way yeah. into real estate because yeah, we're yeah, talking yeah, about yeah, your yeah, mistakes, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. you just, you, you said something. Yeah, that I want to clarify. Man manufactured homes. Okay. So that the ones that's they're brought out on a chassis and they're stacked. Yes, correct. They're stacked. Wow. Yep. Well, I know they can stack. You know the shipping containers. I didn't know they could stack those things. Yes. yes All right. Because well, I know modular wise, there's a lot of companies that are coming out there locally too. I don't. They're not part of the show, so I'm not going to say their name. Mm -hmm. um, and you can, you know, they're behind like hundreds of thousands of homes because they haven't even opened yet, right? And so. It's just going to take a while for those modular homes to come out there and they're amazing looking. Yeah. Well, um, we've also done some modular uh, hotels as well. We worked with like Hyatt and, and then one in San Francisco. Really? And it's pretty, it's pretty popular. A lot of the new ones, like uh, you'll see like the transcontinental and the other ones, they're actually modular uh, hotel builds, but they don't talk about it. So they'll put them on cranes and they're just boxes that are pre-built at a factory and then brought in. But, uh, but yeah, we're, I guess we're going away from the tangent. Well, no, but that, <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Cause I've seen those in San Diego where mm -hmm. they did the same thing like that in San Diego. Um, and that's, those type of things in our industry that we're in the real estate and the mortgage, those things are going to, we're just so short on homes, manu, um, multifamily and single family, um, you know, that we need so much more of that going on. And I just don't know when it's going to turn around and, and more pr being produced. And we need that. And that's another issue that you have to look at is you don't know as a manufacturer of a manufactured home or even modular home, you know, how many should I do? How many should I make? Should I only order them on time? Should I make them as they go? Um, because they could use a lot more of them. Cause I know I'm asked all the time, how do I know anybody who does this stuff? And I always tell them to go to you um, because I know you <laughs> and these other people I don't know and you're large. And so I want them to go to somebody who knows what's going on. Yeah, no, so. de definitely got to go with the, the expert, right? <laughs> yes, you do. Yeah. So you, did you write a book on manufacturing homes yet? <laughs> almost there almost there you're 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 now my uh, hero now you've you've gotten there first so yeah. you've got you've, you've got to the top of the mountain i said I, I sent you a text remember after uh after you wrote the book i said uh, hey you want to make sure you don't forget me now that you've, you're a big book writer now right yeah <laughs> i'm a published author Publish, number yeah. one amazon bestseller uh, bestseller so yeah. hey don't shortchange yourself i'm not you know since you're very humble right i know you're yeah. humble. Well, it's just you know it's just hard to when you come from being dirt road poor and getting to where you are, you're like, you know, you you understand that everything can be gone in a second, right? My dad was well, at age 12. I lost my dad to hairy cell leukemia. We went from the good side of town to the freaking bad side of town. And I, that's why I say dirt road poor, because you understand that. If I said over on west side of Turlock, mm -hmm. you wouldn't understand what I'm talking about. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, that's those are the fun times. I think that's built all of uh, our character, right? I mm -hmm. think uh, trying to figure out how to how to you know make I, i'd actually literally go to different stores just to try to save 10 cents i mean i'd go to like from long's drugs to walgreens to see you know what's going to give me the best deal and i remember like uh you know they used to have these little square coupons at walgreens where you could cut them out and then you get these snow globes that are on sale for like 29 cents or something like that and the other kids would get like cool gifts that are like five ten dollars i had to like wait for the sale and get the 29 cent little thing to give out to the kids and i thought it was neat but later i thought oh you know what Todd, you're just a cheap guy no i couldn't afford it sorry i i went to pay less you sir yeah you guys got nikes i got pay less i don't think i just thought that they didn't even have brands at pay less right i remember no they have their own brand and then other brands yeah because we used to take our kids to pay less we could afford more but they went through the shoes so fast you don't need more and as a kid i only had one pair of shoes three uh two pair of pants and three shirts so i mean that's how poor so yeah so i remember that's why i got so much clothes in my closet that i don't use <laughs> Um, I don't know if you knew that back in the day, there's a thing called Macy's Clearance Center. So they actually threw all the rejected clothes from Macy's to this clearance center where you could like get stuff for like a couple bucks. So I didn't even know my brother would take me like once a year. 
uh, to Macy's Clearance Center and he spent like 150 bucks and that would be my all of my clothes. But what was neat was that every time, and I want to say neat, but I tried to find it neat, was that there was some defect of some sort on every single clothing that I had? Like it was missing a button, or the <laughs> or, or the or the pockets on the wrong side. <laughs> and uh, my my rich friends were like, "Oh, you know what? All you need to do is get some nice like Z Caffarici jeans or an, or some nice Levi's, Todd. Why don't you do that?" But the people that have money, they don't realize that the people who don't have it can't afford to do that. So they're like just, just, just completely clueless. I don't know if you've had friends that you know back when you were growing up, they just didn't know. They don't. They didn't kind of comprehend the fact that you couldn't afford just one nice pair of jeans i mean you'd rather have five pairs rather than just one right yeah i mean we everybody wanted certain just you know designer clothes or whatever but i grew up in the 80s so you know it was bell bottoms and i didn't want bell bottoms but that's what i had so <laughs> mine was a little, uh, a little early 90s i think it was high school around the 90s so it was... yeah well i was in i graduated 84 so i'm older than you Oh, just, just a little bit. Yeah, a couple of years. <laughs> All right. So I want you to think, what do you want to leave people with that you learned from what you went through? Uh, you know, I, I think number one is, um, you know, as far as uh, diversifying and trust, I think is really, really important. But uh, I think uh, growing up, I think more than anything else, le- completely appreciating what you have. I mean, gratefulness, I think, is very underrated. People don't talk about it. And I think the quality that most people have always said that helped our business grow is giving people the thought process of, hey, you know what, when, when you're given something, whether it's small or large, to be very grateful for it. And even to today, um, the fact that I get to go to a Warriors game or I get to go, you know, um, you know, not have to, you know, go into a 7-Eleven. And I used to have to think before I grabbed a Snickers bar. I used to go, oh, gosh, you know, I could buy the Snickers bar over at, you know, the Lucky's for 60 cents less. I should go do that. And it's almost like a mind thing. And now I'm like, you know what? I can afford to do that now. I can, it's, it's okay. I, I, and then when I grab it, I'm like grateful that I can afford to do it and save it. So I know you're smiling, but I'm smiling little, because <laughs> I know your wife's been like, why did you pick up that snicker bar, man? <laughs> you're supposed to be losing weight, not gaining weight. That's the first thing I thought. Of. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I'm not, I don't know if she does that, but I just uh, know. We all, you know, we're at the point where we might eat a little bit more calories than we should. We try to exercise, but it might not be everything we do. Yeah, I'm not sure if I still fit on the screen here. If you, that pan shot, you might want to use the other shot. You're good. A You're still good. <laughs> Todd, and thank you for stopping by today. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm glad you came into town. We had lunch and then you came over here to, and talk about this because I think people need to realize how successful people haven't always been successful.